Hi, I'm Yolanda Cope Stepney, and you're listening to Speak On. We talk all things culture, society, and well-being. Pigeons around the world are fuming because their way of life is being attacked as their favourite hangout spots are torn from plinths, thrown into rivers, destroyed, or removed from display. Alongside our agitated, feathery friends, there are huge swathes of people outraged at the desecration and disrespect being levelled at key historical figures who've been watching over towns and cities across the UK. Why? Because they've been fed a story of Great Britain, building an empire and building the wealth of the nation with nobility and strength. But for the people who were living their lives quite happily until people rocked up and discovered them or civilised them or straight up kidnapped them, the story is very different. The Black Lives Matter protests this year started with a rallying cry against police brutality, but also shed light on systemic racism in an unprecedented way, including how desperately we need an overhaul of the history curriculum and that many of us have a lot to unlearn. Otherwise, it just looks like a load of rowdy anti-racist folks are just tearing down statues for bants. But if you don't know the good, the bad and the ugly and the truth about history, then you'll never really understand why people are upset. Today we're going to discuss some of Britain's problematic past and start to help people understand why people like me might not be quite so keen on seeing these figures on display. Today I'm joined by Professor Nandini Chatterjee and Professor Richard Toy from the University of Exeter where they teach Empire, the Controversies of British Imperialism. Thank you so much for joining me, Nandini and Richard. Thank you for having Great us. Great pleasure to be here. Brilliant. Okay, so I will start with um, Richard. Can you give us an overview of the course, please? Yes, so the course explores the British Empire through six themes across six weeks, and those themes are money, violence, race, religion, sex and gender, and propaganda. So I think what is, uh, I might say a word about how we sort of came up with that structure, Mm -hmm. because we did consider if we should try and do a sort of comprehensive survey of the British Empire from the beginning uh, through to the end in a sort of chronological way, which is, of course, a perfectly logical way to do it. But um, I think there were sort of issues with, with doing that because we've got, we've got a range of, of excellent colleagues at Exeter who contributed to the course, mm-hmm. but you know our expertise uh, maybe is not such that we could do an absolutely comprehensive account and then we'd be sort of criticised for, for leaving things out. So the, the solution was to have a thematic approach and not to be claiming to uh, cover everything, but rather to say, well, these are sort of hot button issues where historians have disagreed and have debated. And uh, it's really a, very much about encouraging the students who come from all over the world, not, not just in Britain, although there's a sort of heavy concentration of, of them in Britain, mm-hmm. uh, to, to encourage the students to debate and engage with each other. And I think that is uh, what has made the course successful is that, um, in a way, people want to engage with it because they will see another comment that somebody has left and they may well sort of disagree strongly with that comment and feel that they must therefore respond and so we get an awful lot of uh, of comments left on the site and people do respond to each other and I think it's very different from you know other online courses like I don't know dental hygiene or something where the uh, you know the methodology is to have some videos showing how you sort of do dental hygiene work and people don't feel the, the sort of the need to argue about that they're just sort of absorbing uh, you know the facts so our, our approach we call it the controversies of British imperialism we know that people are going to disagree mm-hmm. we expect them to disagree uh you know there's there's we can't sort of impose we can give our views but we can't impose our views or um you know force people to think the way we do so it is very much about uh, stimulating discussion and debate mm-hmm. that sounds amazing um and i'll go over to nandini what would you say are the benefits of learning about this kind of like problematic history and I say problematic because, like you were saying, this course um, invokes discussion and debate. Um, what do you hope people get from this? Um, I think uh, Richard has set, set out the terms really um, effectively. I think there are several benefits. 
starting from simply providing people with more information. Um, precisely where issues are controversial, I think in order to actually come to a balanced judgment about them, it's necessary to simply get more and more nuanced information about topics out there. Mm -hmm. Once that's done, I think what happens is that people hopefully also realize that not everything is novel. So many of the controversies or controversial things, even people that we deal with in the course, are also there are parallels to them in present day life. So people can see that such things have been debated in the past too. Mm -hmm. And people have found solutions to them. And overall, I think, at least that is my aim as a, as a historic history researcher, is to kind of lead people to the feeling that history is not a morality tale. Yeah. People are complex, um, there are, and we don't always have to um, create balance sheets. Um, mm -hmm. Excellent people do terrible things, yeah. and we should be able to uh, deal with critical heritage of that kind. Yeah, I completely agree. I think uh, I've seen a, a fair amount of discussion on this uh, on Facebook, including some people I know being incredibly outraged. But then they were outraged because they were like, what are you saying about these people? They didn't do these things. And I was like, it's OK that they did. I think we just need to know. Indeed. <laughs> you know, there's no. Why are we hiding mm. it? All the like you were saying, people are complex and excellent people can do terrible things. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I, I love that's why I'm so excited about this course. And I'm definitely going to sign up. Um, <laughs> <laughs> why? Um, and this can go to either of you. Why do you think that we've been presented with such a glossy like version of British imperialism? I, I think that we have to remember that there's been a sort of a whole history of education about the empire, which goes back to the period of the empire itself. And of course, this was particularly intense in the late Victorian period, uh, but it certainly continued sort of through to the 1950s. So sort of you know, well within living memory. And in a way, many of the, the, the ways in which people now argue about empire and the history of the empire are actually remarkably similar to the ways in which they argued about the empire at the time that it actually existed. So I think there has always been a uh, sort of a strand in the, um, in, the, in the way in which empire has been taught which says, oh yes, of course we do recognise that some, some bad things happened, but you know, either these were exceptional or they were sort of all to the greater good in the great scheme of things because overall the, the sort of the empire brought so many benefits. So I think that um, in, in the sort of the balance sheet approach which Nandini was mentioning, which, which we want to avoid, um, you know, the, the, the balance sheet is often constructed in such a way as to sort of appear to be fair and balanced by saying, oh yes, we recognise there were some problems, but then to come back in the, in, in the end and say, well, taken everything into account, yes, there were a few massacres, but on the other hand, the British built lots of roads and uh, bridges in India and railway lines, so shouldn't we on the whole say that the, you know, the British Empire was a pretty good thing? And kind of carrying on from there, I think, if I may, um, in, into the present day, um, my own education uh, was not in Britain. So until, um, until my PhD, I actually studied um, in India. And if we have time, we can actually go um, to some extent into some details of how teaching about empire is done uh, in Indian schools. But from what I actually see here in, in Britain, I actually find quite heartening as far as um, school syllabi are concerned. I think the problems actually arise at the level of um, national examinations. Prior to that, there are really good books around which um, are taught, at least in certain schools. So my own son goes um, to a state school um, and they did actually get taught the British Empire, which actually was taught far better than I was taught in India because just to put that in there in India it's actually taught once again as a drama in which the Indians are victims and the British are uniformly the evil evil folk whereas here mm. um, the way it was taught 
it was also focused on many other mm-hmm. parts of India. So, chil- I'm sorry, of the world, pardon me. Um, so that actually children get to learn about North America, about Native Americans. Mm-hmm. They're taught about Africa. So you get a more global vision of things. And the way it's actually written out is not glossy and la- nationalistic at all. If anything, actually, it's extremely critical. But the problem, I think, oh, and yeah. I we do have to step back there, I think, is with the school examination boards the options that are available and the teacher training that is available so that teachers there are some uh, options available um, in which you can Mm -hmm. actually take an exam um, on the British Empire at GCSE level the AQA offers it for example but very few teachers are willing to um, coach uh, students on those topics Um, which is a problem that we then have a populace which has very low levels of information uh, about the topic and so they're very quickly pushed into this nationalist narrative so it either has to be good overall or bad overall and you need to fold things in okay slavery is embarrassing but let's fold it in um, and if you had that level of knowledge um, then I think that would be harder to do yeah interesting yes yeah, when I was um like obviously based on my own school experience it was my the history I was taught in school it was really it was very Tudor heavy <laughs> incredibly I know so much about the Tudors um but mm. when we covered anything to do with kind of anything that would cover black history colonialism slavery etc actually it was parents that had to push for that to be taught in school at the time so at middle in middle school we were, it wasn't a thing it wasn't really a thing and when we were talk, taught about the empire it really was a completely glossed over version so I don't obviously I'm I'm 38 so this was a while ago now I'm sure there's loads of changes since but it Truly, I learned nothing about anything other than look at all these amazing things they did. And they went there and they basically saved all these people. It was very mm. much that kind of that kind of rhetoric. And, you know, there is so much history. Which bits do you choose as well? I understand that that's also an issue. But there were huge things that were glossed over that I think was are so relevant to society and the structure of society today that I think would be really beneficial for us to learn. And, yeah, that was just it just completely missed out of my school altogether. Anything that I learned was because my mum is basically just like more of a, a history enthusiast. And uh, she... Um, has a teaching degree and so she used to teach classes in my hometown but when she taught it it wasn't this whole kind of Britain bad everyone else good it was just this really kind of balanced like you were saying excellent people can be bad so she said okay here's this person here are the things they did that weren't great and here are the other things they did that were so it was kind of still unbiased even though obviously we're all incredibly still upset about slavery Um, (laughs) and and the and the colonialism and the like you know everything that's presented to us as black people in the present day um and when i've seen people discussing this online people are very passionate either way and very upset about statues being taken down and i was like well i have no problem with them being displayed somewhere just display it with just and just kind of just tell the truth about what happened we just don't have to gloss over it i think it doesn't help i think it's good to know as much as you can essentially so since obviously black lives matter um the movement has been I suppose it's just been everywhere. Everybody's been talking about it and future learn um, have shared um, information about the course. Have you had a massive uptake in sign-ins? Uh, yeah. Um, so on the, the current round of the course, it sort of, um, as, I, as I mentioned, it runs for six weeks and then there's, there's sort of a gap and then we sort of do a new round. So it's now on the, the 22nd round. And this time around, we've had 11,000 people sign up, which is wow. a, a big spike. And given that the, you know, the course has now been sort of going for about five years, um, obviously, you know, tens of thousands of people have now passed through it. Um, and, you know, this is, that's obviously far more students than uh, Nandini and I would engage with in the classroom as, as part of our regular teaching. So I think it's been a, a great opportunity. And I mean, I, I would say it is an opportunity for teachers as well um, in that if, I mean, there, there are, as Nandini was saying, there are all sorts of resources which are available out there for people to devise lesson plans and so forth. Um, but I think what's uh, sort of remarkable about the course, and I don't quite know how we managed to do it, but I think we were very successful, is that people from A-level, people people working for their A-levels, through to people who have actually already got PhDs, have done the course and found it uh, interesting and beneficial. And I think that's 
you know, because we're not trying to be um, didactic, we are sort of trying to put up themes for, for discussion and debate and obviously provide certain key information. So um, mm -hmm. clearly the people doing PhDs may well sort of be refreshing their memories about uh, particular things rather than coming, coming to it new for the first time. But I mean, I think that um, you know, some of the course could be used uh, directly in lessons. I mean, all, all the bits of all the separate bits of the, um, the little videos are all kind of available on YouTube. So um, mm -hmm. teachers, teachers could use them directly in class. Yeah. And how what's the actual structure of the course then? So when uh, people sign up, what can they um, how do they how can they expect to learn? Well, um, it's in, in theory, one would allocate sort of two or three hours per week and do it over six weeks. But of course, um, you know, you're not obliged to uh, do any of it if you if you don't want, if you sort of log in, sort of sign up for the course, decide that it's not really for you, having kind of watched a couple of the videos or read a couple of the, the short articles, then that's obviously fine. Some people sort of burn through the whole thing you know sort of in the course of a week and sort of leave yeah. everybody else behind others yeah. it is a, it is available after the six weeks are, are up um for a period so um you can't you don't have to have sort of stuck rigidly to your to your six weeks timetable i mean i know how hard it is to uh, you know, find the the time to dedicate to an online course but i think that one thing we're successful in is keeping uh, you know, a large number of the people who sign up at the beginning interested and engaged through to week six, and partly that is because they are they are arguing with each other, and uh, in a sense can't leave it alone. I love that. Okay, um, Nandini, what do you obviously I asked the question before, like what do you hope people take away from the course? But what do you hope people take away from the course that would be helpful in the current climate while people are dis having these discussions particularly about statues remaining up or whatever um how do you hope this will help i think it would really help if um particularly in britain if people could um let go of the we in talking about the british mm -hmm. empire um uh, whenever yeah. people try to inhabit the past that's actually a work of fantasy none of us were actually mm -hmm. there in the past but we speak in a way that actually shapes our thinking. So we say in a way, we went out there, we did these things. And the moment you talk out like that, you also feel that it's a personal attack on you uh, when people say, well, you guys did these bad things. The truth is, is, it's all they, it's all guys in the past, men and women in the past who did different things. And we are all mm -hmm. inheritors of that legacy in a way, that complex legacy, no matter where we were born or what our skin color mm -hmm. is, uh, what our politics is, we all have inherited it. And we need to deal with that. And if that is so, yeah. then there's no need for us to defend what is indefensible. There, it is indefensible to enslave another human being. Um, and, and I can multiply examples. It's also, I think, indefensible that a multinational corporation runs amok and starts actually taking over countries. Some things are indefensible. Yes. So we can actually let it be uh, where it is, understand how it was, take warning in some senses uh, from the pitfalls. Mm -hmm. But there is also a lot to appreciate. I think um, we can appreciate what was, in fact, also the cosmopolitan side of empire. Um, one thing I talk mm -hmm. about in my lectures is how, how actually the British Empire was one of the biggest Islamic empires in the world, which is not something we think about in sheer number mm -hmm. of Muslims that were in it. And so we often yeah. think of cultural or ethnic diversity in Britain as something that has happened very recently. Well, actually, the British mm -hmm. Empire was extremely diverse. It's also actually created circulation of peoples and ideas all over the world. Perhaps we can embrace that cosmopolitanism. Yeah, that's a great answer. I loved everything you said. I might, actually, I'm going to get that sound bite. And I'm just going to start playing it on Facebook whenever anybody says anything. It's yeah. perfect. <laughs> could, could I just jump in because I, I just yeah, thought what it. Nandini said was so important about this idea of ownership and I think that when you start talking about decolonizing the curriculum and talking about diversity and so on to me and Nandini and I'm sure to you these seem like you know positive uh, progressive uh, essentially innocuous things and you know, I, I do think they are, but one has to understand that on the other side, there are people who do feel that any criticism 
of the British Empire, even if it happened 200 years ago, is some form of personal attack. And what Nandini said about the we is incredibly important because you get people who um, say that um, you know people go to university, you know, the students go to university and are then are lectured by people like me and Nandini about how bad their ancestors were, right? As though we're kind of shaming them. Well, you know, I don't know who my students' ancestors were. I don't know whether they were awful. I don't know if they were great. I'm you know, fundamentally not really that interested. Um, you know, and I'm certainly not trying to shame the students and say that, you know, that the students are bad people because maybe their ancestors did bad things. Maybe my ancestors did bad things. I, I just don't know. Um, but I, I will just add one thing, which is that it's not all completely in the past. Um, you know, what happened, the slave trade obviously is, but there is, you know, honestly, really bad stuff that happened within living memory carried out by some people who were still alive. And I'm talking here about um, you know, the repression of the uh, so-called emergency in Malaya after 1948. I'm talking about the, the Mau Mau and so on. And indeed, until very recent years, uh, of course, you know, documents were deliberately destroyed at the time of decolonization. Other, other documents were deliberately suppressed for decades and have only come out, it's only come out recently. So I think that one, one has to bear in mind that um, you know, there are the people who, were, who think that we're trying to shame them on account of their ancestors, and then there actually are the people who, um, you know, often under considerable pressure, of course, as, as young men in the colonies, mm -hmm. did actually carry out war crimes. Yeah. Yeah that's, yeah, that's such a good point. And I think the point uh, that both of you have made about it's not personal is actually genuinely, again, a conversation so much comes back to things are happening on Facebook, but it's where people discuss everything now. And when I have been, I've been sharing lots of information about like Black Lives Matter, etc., to help just demystify it because I think, you know, if you just go to the press for things, you're yeah. just getting opinion, aren't you? And so I've been showing things saying, OK, here are the things that people are upset about. Here's what we're protesting about, if that helps people understand this a little bit more. So just kind of giving people context, because essentially when I try to describe systemic racism, and everything else, it's so, it's so insidious. Everybody thinks I'm it's like everybody thinks I'm wearing a tinfoil hat <laughs> because it's so insidious. It, everything sounds like a conspiracy theory. You know, it's like, well, this is, you know, women, uh, black women are 243% more likely to die during childbirth. This is because of an old mm. belief that we have thicker skin and this was to do with experimentation that happened on us during slavery and colonial times. Mm. And when I say that, everybody just thinks I'm insane. I'm like, no, no, it's very much documented. Yeah. Um, and I think knowing about all these different things in history are brilliant because it helps give context. It helps us learn. I mean, my granddad was problematic. So, you know, I mean, if yeah. anyone says anything about him, I don't take it personally. Yeah. So I keep saying to them, you know, it's just about understanding what it is, understanding how it can still have an effect on society so we can understand where we are right now. No one is saying anything personal. You know, at the time, people did what they thought was right or people did, like you made a really good point, what, did what they were pressured to do. Mm. They did what they could do within the framework that existed at that time. And... You know, unless I'm going to go back in time and start, I don't know, pimp slapping people. There's nothing I can really do about it now, except for let's find a way to learn, educate ourselves, etc. I mean, I'm still slightly salty about having my taxes going towards paying reparations to slave masters until yes. 2015. I'd love a refund. I'd love yes. one. I feel like I deserve it, but <laughs> I am, I'm OK with it. And I'm OK, just like I'm OK with the fact that David Cameron's ancestors were compensated and that's obviously helped him build a legacy of wealth and money that still you know sits in his account now but I'm not going to blame him because he didn't do it so I really love that kind of message of saying here are these things let's address it let's understand it and then let's use this to help us understand what's happening now I think that's really important so actually what well, I would also yeah. like to add that all these kind of um, evils that actually humans have done in the past they're not just uniformly racially distributed either. So yeah, since we no. all talked about our um, ancestors, let me talk about my ancestors as well, because I actually come from a very high caste uh, family uh, in, in India. What that directly meant to me as a, as a woman is that some of my foremothers would have been burned to death 
um, as widows because of uh, because of a horrible Hindu custom of uh, encouraging widows to be burnt together with the corpses of their husbands. That's so and, sad. And yeah. That's right. And but that is also indefensible. And that was also mm. actually done. But whose whose legacy is that? I'm not going to defend mm. those ancestors who actually did the, the did that burning. If there's any legacy that I want to inherit, I want to inherit the legacy of the reformers of the of the men and women who fought against it. Also, the yeah. Christian missionaries um, on whom I did some work who were prejudiced at times, but at times they were really warriors that made a change. Um, mm. So it is a complex legacy. And we really need yeah. to think beyond that. Yeah, absolutely. I think it's, I think when we're having these discussions again on social media, it is people just dividing and seeing everything really is quite not, not black and white in terms of racial construct, just black and white in the, you know, in the way the saying goes. I think, I think also that there's, there's a, an element in which it's not just that people sort of disagree about the content of the history, they actually disagree about the purpose of the history. And of course, a lot of people, yeah understandably enough don't really know what it is that academic historians do and of course not all academic historians are the same we have a, a variety of different approaches and methodologies and, and a, a variety of different ideological beliefs to be sure um, but I think that uh, you know again you know we stress uh, the complexity we sort of try and stress sort of the inter interconnectedness of everything uh, but there and, and this is very powerful in the public sphere um, I mean, you mentioned David Cameron, um, you know, Nandini sort of mentioned this in Indian education system earlier on, that it's not just about what happens in schools, it's about the messages which are sent by politicians who try and recruit various parts of history for their own purposes, often for nationalist purposes. And so in the, that's, that's so powerful on many people that it becomes, it, it, again, reinforces this idea of we and you know us against them ultimately as though it's sort of history is a sort of a zero-sum game and so that you know if we can prove ourselves to have been virtuous then we've sort of you know scored off somebody else at the same time and so it's this I think that when trying to argue with um, you know people online one needs to sort of bear in mind that for a lot of them history really is about heroes and villains uh, and they, they regard it as a, as a kind of point scoring exercise and so that is what makes them often so incredibly um, you know angry and vociferous um, so that we're not we're not just having a, a sort of a conversation about the nature of history there's a there's a, a, a disguised dispute about the purpose of history at the same time yeah absolutely again i'm going to be using all of these like i'm going to when this podcast comes out i'm just going to just every time i see anyone discussing it i'm just going to keep sharing the link yeah. okay so um i'm going to go over to nandini for this how do we have all the treasures and items from like other countries in our museums and we kind of quite proudly display it even though we weren't given permission to take it i don't know the permission that existed at the time um do you think it's right that we have it should we give them back should we display it like we stole it what should we do i think it's a really complicated one um the kind of post the the kind of nationalistic stand from post-colonial nations such as india would be of course it should be all given back and every time there is a right-wing kind of uh, move for this from india and i say um and i'm consciously right-wing um there's a demand for the Kohinoor, the diamond and the crown jewels to be returned. But here things mm -hmm. do get a little bit complicated because who is it that those treasures are going to be returned to? In some Such cases, actually, the answer is much simpler, as in where there are um, these um, human remains which were, t which were intended for um, ritual and ceremonial disposal and whose mm -hmm. taking actually um, entailed a violation of those people's uh, dignities. And now the demand frequently is that, for instance, shrunken heads, which were uh, collected from Southeast Asia and beyond, be returned for a decent uh, burial. Um, mm -hmm. And that's one kind of thing which actually calls for a closing, for a, uh, for a peaceful end um, to that story. It's 
quite yeah. different on the other hand from high value artifacts such as for instance the crown jewels or um, art or kind of um, armaments etc we have actually recently seen a businessman from India who actually is um, well known otherwise for not paying taxes, uh, having yeah. purchased um, a historical sword in, in auction uh, from, mm -hmm. from Britain and taken it home. Um, to me, that's actually not reparation at all. That's actually another kind of uh, looting because it actually then exits the public sphere mm -hmm. and goes into an individual businessman's kind of um, closed collection. Having yeah. said all that, where there are facilities being made, where there are adequate facilities, and I know the whole point about adequate facilities itself is debated, but where there are mm -hmm. adequate facilities um, available for proper uh, receipt as well as display of those artifacts, which I, I think is the case with Greece, although I will not actually make precise you know, points about precise artifacts, but where that's the case, mm -hmm. then I think there may be some system devised so that at least the two countries can share those artifacts um, yeah. and find a way in which they display them um, in turns, perhaps. Perhaps a replica gets replaced in one place over another, and we tell that story of our common heritage together. That makes so much sense because, like you were saying, with that guy, um, with that that man um, purchasing that thing and bringing it back to India. Well, who is it for if it sits in his private collection? Is he handing it over to the government? Is it in a museum? Where is it? And then who, I don't know, who owns the pink slip to it as well? So, oh, But he does awesome. individually with his um, untaxed paid money, actually. Oh, that's upsetting. <laughs> so, yes, like you're saying, it's another form of looting. He still hasn't actually, he's just taking it, taking it home to his own house, I suppose, as opposed to giving it back to the country. Interesting. Um, okay, so over to Richard. Um, what can people do outside of the course um, to kind of understand more about history, the good, the bad, the ugly, etc.? Well, um, you know, we have resources on the course uh, in terms of reading lists where we make suggestions for things that to, for people to read. Mm -hmm. uh, I would encourage people to join their local branch of the Historical Association for example, which often has um, you know, talks on, on all aspects of history, not only uh, imperial history. Um, I'm sure that ours is not the only uh, you know, online course um, we, you know, on, on valuable and interesting aspects of, um, uh, of global history. So I'm sure that there, there are many to be sought out. Mm -hmm. um, and I mean, you know, I, I, I guess I would encourage people to uh, consider studying history in a formal way. I mean, not not everybody has the opportunity, but of course, um, people who are deciding what they're going to study at university, uh, I think that doing a sort of a you know a six week course uh, online is a pretty good way of finding out if you if if you've sort of got the the mindset, if you like, to study history. Because I think that um, hi history uh, people often sort of get the sense that. We, we're sort of standing at the front of a lecture hall you know, giving a series of facts of, or you know, telling people what to think. Mm -hmm. Very much what we want to do is encourage people to learn a set of skills which are to do with locating and assessing evidence and evaluating it and then making arguments on the basis of that evidence and supported by evidence. So there is, there is, a, there is honestly a widespread kind of Daily Mail style, style belief that mm -hmm. Uh, we sit around in the universities sort of preaching left-wing doctrine yeah. and I was I, I, I literally I mean, it was a new one for me it had not happened before but yesterday on Twitter I was called a Stalinist which was very <laughs> very original um, uh, 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 but but you know we're not interested uh, in in sort of imposing our particular beliefs because mm -hmm. I'm sure that even if we tried to do so we wouldn't actually be successful yeah. what we are interested in is um, uh, getting people to look at documents and then think, well, what can we say on the basis of this? You know, which other documents should we put it into relationship to? What sort of what kind of concepts, what theoretical concepts might help us to understand this? So it's really about getting a set of skills which are incredibly useful um, you know, just for citizenship, I think, and mm -hmm. the, the ability to have a, you know a, an argument a, a rational argument w with 
I mean, it's very difficult to do so online because people's people's um, tempers you know, do fray so yeah. easily. But mm -hmm. sort of knowing what are sort of legitimate and non-legitimate ways of arguing is mm -hmm. something which history teaches not just not just history of course you know all all the humanities and you know other other disciplines like political science as well yeah that's perfect and nandini do you have anything to add um i think um, richard has mainly talked about formal learning um but i personally think that there is more scope for public understanding of history as well and i think we need to work together um, not only just um, academics, but we need to actually join hands with people in the media, people, especially school teachers. I think school teachers have a huge role to play in actually taking history, by which I mean this evidence-based understanding of the past and, in a sense, empathy for the past out in the public sphere, um, so that we actually have a raising of standards of debates in the public sphere. Let's face it, not everyone's going to actually study history, but we should be able to look at something in a newspaper that says X did Y or whatever, and that person actually says, hang on, what's the evidence for that? Uh, how are they arguing this? This doesn't make sense. And that's the spirit that needs to be inculcated, I think. Yeah, so kind of like critical analysis yes. and critical thinking needs to I suppose, like you, like you were saying, uh, Richard, as well, that learning history can really help improve those skills. Um, and yes. yeah, it's something I, I like you were saying again on Facebook, tempers are fraying and you can actually see the absence of that. Even myself, I'm, I'm a victim of it. If I get really annoyed about something, then I'll just be, I don't know, I just kind of go, yeah, um, <laughs> <laughs> lose my temper. And then I'll go back and I'm like, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. This is actually what I think. No, I've had a moment to kind of like yeah. kind of be a bit clearer about it. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, I think on, on the positive side, I would, you know, in a way, obviously, the internet creates all sorts of problems because people say sort of all crazy, all kinds of crazy stuff, and people have difficulty distinguishing between, um, you know, truth and fiction. But on the other hand, you know, the internet gives us opportunities to do things like this, and um, you know, a form of, in in effect, a kind of broadcasting, which. 20 years ago we wouldn't have been able to do we wouldn't have been able to create a podcast and just put it out there and i do think that in some ways uh, sort of streaming services um, create opportunities too in that we're no longer so tied to um, you know, a, a limited number of national broadcasters who will uh, make you know, a small number of history programs who think they know the kinds of things that drive ratings and are very basically small c conservative in terms of what they're prepared to put on. So I think that uh, you know, there's scope for people to access uh, history series, documentaries from all around the world, all sorts of unex unexpected aspects of history, which they can you know, just you know, dip into. And so I, th I think that is actually a, a positive aspect of um, modern technology. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Nandini, do you have any like closing thoughts or anything you'd like to add? Um, I just want to thank you actually for asking these questions. It's really nice when one sees the relevance of what one studies and the way you actually frame those questions um, helped us both, I think, Richard and I, to actually think yes. of what we do as citizens. So we uh, are professional academics, we are professional historians, we have certain methods of studying the past, but we are also citizens. Um, and we need to actually bring our skills, as everybody needs to bring their skills, into public debate. And you've given us the opportunity for doing that. So thank you. Yes, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. I'm just so, it's just been so exciting and great to have you um, on the show. Again, it's like I've seen so much, so much conversation online and I was like, I just really want to speak to some historians about it. And when I saw this course, it just seemed perfect. And I really want to encourage and drive people towards it because I think a lot of people as well are coming at this from a place where they don't actually fully understand a lot of the history. And like like myself, I had there are huge gaps in my knowledge. There have been times I start typing and then I stop and I was like, no, because I actually truly don't know what the hell I'm talking about. So I need to shut up. And so I think it's something doing something like this would just help me to be able to join in with that but in a completely rational way without it turning into some kind of massive argument but in a way that I can hope, hopefully encourage other people to find out more information and understand it themselves but also like you've both said explain that this is complex and also really separate it from the we 
so it's not so personal so people don't feel under attack but when it comes to saying anything about British history because people have taken it really personally and it's quite upsetting to see them take it so personally when you mm. don't mean it like that as well mm. um, but yeah oh thank you so much for coming on and um, actually are there any other courses at, at the university that are like um, in this vein at all well yes um, I, but in, in a different way so mm -hmm. the first uh, free online course that the University of Exeter did was on climate change yeah and so uh, again with future learn but I, I think that there's a slightly different dynamic there because um, you know, people do want to argue about the empire. Of course, it is true that climate change is a very controversial topic as well. Mm -hmm. But the people who were signing up for it were really people who wanted to learn about the science. There weren't sort of climate change deniers coming on there sort of wanting to say, no, 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 you're all wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that... Um, I, that you know, maybe maybe others have sort of followed in our wake. I don't know, but I, I think that that our the Empire course is unique in the way in which it is sort of structured around trying to explicitly encourage debate rather than simply being didactic. Mm -hmm. Brilliant. Okay, then. Well, thank you both so much for joining me. Th thank great. you for having us. Thank you. Let's have a great day. Thank, thank you. You. you too. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to Speak On. Make sure you like, subscribe and share with your friends, family, co-workers, strangers in the street. To find out more about us, including our upcoming events, head over to Instagram, instagram.com forward slash speakon underscore. Bye.